Welcome, Welcome to, to the Gun, the gun Shop, Shop Show. Show. We, are we are talking, talking about, about a gun. A, there is probably no more hot topic or potentially controversial topic than today's show topic, which is all about AR-15s. I'm your host, Eli Bruton, and alongside me in the homemade control room is my man, Trevor. Hello! And then to my right is What's Logan. Up? And... Today is all about AR-15s, and uh, we're going to break down why are they so popular. They're definitely, in the radio promo for leading up to the show, we did liberals hate them, gun owners love them, they're America's favorite semi-auto rifle, and they certainly are, um, but we've got some headlines we need to cover, some crazy stuff happening in the world, and we have a voice mailbox full of questions about ARs. Jam packed. Packed, full to the brim. To the brim. So uh, we're going to do that today, so stick with us. Also, uh, remember to get your free Liberty Tree Guns decal. Free. We've had people jumping on this. We decided to give away our bumper stickers for absolutely free, including free shipping. All you have to do is go where, Logan? To our website at libertytreeguns.com, and then click on the Liberty Tree merch section at the top of the page. There, they'll be free with shipping included. So, yeah, you just go there and get it. You literally just go to the website and get it. And a lot of you have already done that. And we thank you. Make sure that you send us pictures of where you've put them on your car because that makes me so happy. That would be excellent. And uh, if they join our Facebook group, The Gun Shop Show, that'd be a great place to share it. I have been blown away. We created a Facebook group, not a page. This is a group where members can post and create their own discussions for the show. So um, just search The Gun Shop Show on Facebook and you can join Last week we created that and we got up to like 642 members and I made a post and said, hey, if we all invited some like-minded people, do you think we could get to 750 by the end of the day? And what happened? Uh, we blew up. I think we made it over 1,000 by that evening and now mm-hmm. last I checked, I mean, we were 1. closing 8. on two. Yeah, yeah, 1.8, getting, getting ready for two. All right, so let's get something out of the gate. Okay. Uh, what are we going to get out the gate? Mm-hmm. People want to know what does AR stand for in AR-15. I know what most people think it is right. initially. Which it kind of it kind of makes sense why you would come to that conclusion. There's only two letters, right? Right. But uh, yeah, it actually doesn't stand for that at all. No, it doesn't stand for assault rifle. Trevor, I know you did a little research on yeah, the yeah, early history mm-hmm. of that. What does AR and AR-15 stand for? Armalite rifle. It was uh, designed by Armalite originally, and uh, before they sold the patent to Colt, and I believe it was 19, 1959, I think it was. Yeah, they yeah. sold off the uh, patent for AR-10 and the AR-15. I think it's very interesting because people associate the AR-15 with a modern thing that's especially, you know, lethal or especially a problem. Gun control advocates definitely have their eyes on the AR. But when you imagine this thing is being developed in the 1950s. Right, yeah. And uh, something that I thought was uh, really interesting, I mean, uh, again, this is just a derivative of a derivative uh, passed down and modifications made for a scenario. And in this instance, the AR was built to be primarily used for stowage on aircraft um, originally. And uh, so they wanted to make it uh, compact and so you could take it apart and store it and put it back together. That's how it pretty much got started. And now... Millions of people own them. Millions. I don't know. I wonder. I, I didn't check to see what the numbers were versus the AK, but that would be interesting so, information. So globally, it's definitely the AK is um, the more 
predominant rifle in terms of widespread global popularity, but in the United States, there is absolutely no contest. There's probably 10 AR-15s to every AK on the civilian market, and we'll talk about why that is, but um, if you're just joining the show and you never heard us before, this is the Gun Shop Show, where we come to you from the sales floor of the best gun store in the world, in which I am the owner and proprietor and very proud of the store and the crew that we have here at Liberty Tree Guns, Carthage, Missouri. Um, and we're broadcasting from the sales floor of that store right now. So I'm thrilled to get to be here with you on the radio every week. We have some exciting news in the fact that uh, our host station, News Talk KZRG, has opted to pick up a second hour of the Gun Shop Show. So, Which means you no longer have to chase us down on the internet if you want to continue to listen to us. So, if, yeah, if you have seen um, past shows, when we get to the end of the first hour, we're encouraging you to jump over on the live stream, which uh, we always are live on Facebook and YouTube. We are right now. You see us on camera. I can wave at you. Um, so that is an option of a way to uh, to see the show. But now you'll be able to hear it on the radio for at least two hours. And then if we go over two hours, you can join on the live stream. Um, so some interesting things have happened this week. And one is I got a phone call from the ATF. Personally? Uh-oh. Well, uh, <laughs> professionally, they did, yes, uh, they called me to, um, just because I'm a licensed uh, FFL holder, stands for Federal Firearms License, uh, to let me know that they had some direct intel that Antifa had plans to target gun stores and pawn shops uh, in order to steal firearms to be armed for protesting and rioting. So, um, thankfully, we haven't seen any sort of violent encounters here in our area, and we're thankful for that. Our uh, thoughts and prayers go out to those that have seen that. Um, but there's a lot of rumors flying around about things that could happen in the climate right now. And this is just something that I personally witnessed. I had a call from an agent out of the Kansas City ATF office letting me know that that was a possibility that it didn't have specific intel regarding Liberty Tree Guns, but they had um, definitely seen a concerted effort uh, and plans being made. And I saw that uh, looters did try to get into a gun shop in Philadelphia, and it did not end well for them. Did you guys see that headline? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking it over now. I can throw it up on screen. Sweet. So uh, keep in mind, we have your voicemails coming up. Those of you who uh, called the number 208-918-1776 and got your AR questions in. Those are coming up uh, along with uh, more giveaways and some more headlines. But uh, it says, read that headline to me, Trevor. It says, South Philly gun store owner guarding shop overnight shoots, kills armed looter. So uh, what happened was during the rioting in Philadelphia, there was, over two different nights, some uh, looters tried to get into this guy's gun store. And he, it, according to the video, if you click the link on the article, which we'll drop it in the comments, is the oldest gun store in Philadelphia. Mm. And the owner is 67 years old. The first night, they tried to get in a side door of his store. So when he saw that, he decided to stay overnight because he couldn't risk... Uh, his store being vandalized, but he uh, unfortunately had to use deadly force, you know, going into uh, defending his shop, and we're seeing that uh, we're seeing that all across the country. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's sad when bad people ruin it for the peaceful folks. So start getting into what is the AR-15 and what makes it so popular. So um, the AR-15 is a semi-automatic variation of the M-16, which is adopted by the U.S. military uh, and saw its first major uh, wartime use 
during the Vietnam era. And it was kind of a controversial uh, firearm at the time because it was one of the first mainstream firearms to have plastic on it. And there were some reliability issues with the original versions, including some that were made by Mattel. Right. I, that was a kind of a, a, <clears throat> a laughing point when I was in the military is Mattel made your firearm. Uh, you know, how reliable can it be? Yeah, which um, that's not uncommon throughout history. We broke down how Singer, the sewing machine company, had made some right, yeah. firearms. Um, so different manufacturers, if they were capable of manufacturing something intricate on a large scale, mm-hmm. they would get these military contracts to do that. But right, right. Makes good sense. I mean, you've got the, the, the ability, the mechanics, the manufacturing capabilities. Why not? Yeah, but... Fast forward to today, and most of the reliability issues have been resolved. And so what you get is a very modular, very lightweight, very accurate, and uh, easy-to-use firearms platform. And it comes in calibers from 22 long rifle to uh, 9mm to its original configuration in the 223 or 5.56 uh, configuration. We also have it in um, calibers like uh, 350 Legend, 450 Bushmaster, 458 SOCOM, 50 Beowulf. Um, we're going to talk about every configuration under the sun of the AR 15. Why does America love this rifle so much? And we're going to answer your questions when we go checking the voicemail. Right here with your friends in the gun business, the gun shop. The Ruger Security 9 LTO, an exclusive new firearm only from Liberty Tree Guns. This is an affordable pistol that comes with Ruger's renowned reliability and worksmanship and comes with an optic with a three year warranty. If you haven't ever shot a pistol with an optic on it, it's a lot of fun and you can really acquire a target quickly. Alright, Ruger Security 9 LTO unboxing. So it pretty much obviously comes with everything the Ruger Security 9 would already come with. And this is how they look in the box. Ruger started doing this insert in the box, which is kind of nice. Um, we've had to modify it a little bit to make sure that your optic fits. So there's a cutout so the cover can go on and then the gun can fit right here in that. Um, they come with two mags, so a lot of price point guns, you're just getting one mag, but you get two 15 round whoops, um, OEM mags. A couple little bonuses is the optic comes with the AR mounts. So if you wanna pull this optic off and run it on an AR, you've got everything that you need. That's a freebie, just comes in the box. Once we pull this insert out, Here's where all the goodies that come with the optic. Got a three year warranty on the Firefield optic, the user manual. It has the, the uh, tools for both mounting the optic if you wanna take it off, and also the adjustment screwdriver for the windage and elevation, and then all of the factory information for your pistol. So um, this is the format that those will come in. And again, guys, remember this is an option if you are excited to try out an optic on a pistol uh, and you want to do it for a price point. So these at this price are cheaper than some uh, guys are paying for just an optic. You're getting the gun and the optic. You can get the price and all the details at libertytreeguns.com. Just search 
L-T-O. Welcome back to the Gun Shop Show. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the AR-15, and you know what that sound means. I know what that sound means. It means it's time to check the voicemail. We got to check it, dude. It's full. It's over, I saw it was overflowing. This is the most voicemails we've ever had. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that our technology, our proprietary voicemail uh, consumption technology uh-huh. is yeah. able to process that many voicemails. And by the way, mm-hmm. I'm going to get that. The voicemail phone box. Uh, uh, you're gonna get it out, so we can actually. Right yeah, yeah you, you're gonna have to. Otherwise, we won't be able to actually check the voicemail. It would just be, uh, just checking. No voicemail. What happened, man? <laughs> Are you okay? Don't break the phone, then we won't be able to do the voicemail anymore. We're good. <laughs> a We're lot good. of fanfare. <laughs> He's a All showman. Right. All right, I. Uh, I'm good. I have the voicemail phone uh, next to me. Excellent. But you know what else we need to check the voicemail? Oh, you know what? We still don't have a pre-recorded intro to check in the voicemail. So we're just having to do that Mm -hmm. on the fly. fly. Yeah. Good thing I've got ZZ drumsticks here with me. You've got those. And um, I guess all I really have is... uh, is my guitar here. Yeah, that Z- mad axe. Yeah. Mm, ZZ Top Gun. That thing is bad axe. Yeah. Okay. It's good looking. Okay, yeah. so you so, want to try to do the same thing that we did the last time? Yeah, just r- roughly. I mean, I don't really remember, so I'm just going to be playing off you. And uh, we had some issues last time where <sighs> um, the, we had some glitches. Yeah, I noticed on the play. Uh, whenever you know, I rewatched it after because I always rewatch all of our shows right. like, two or three times. I noticed that uh, there seemed to be in a technical glitch, but we're gonna get it this time. Yeah, okay. And you're gonna yeah. see it this yeah, time. Yeah, you're gonna see us rock out right this here. This is not. We're not. These aren't props. Yeah, all right? so it's a real deal. Yeah, you're gonna hear it on the radio, and you're watching on the live stream. You're gonna see us this time. Okay. Okay. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Whenever you right. are. Ready? Here we go. A one, a two, a one. A two, a three, a four. Are you ready to check the voice for I'll tell you what, that yeah. that wasn't too bad. No, I and, thought I thought we did okay. And, you know, you know, um, guys, let me know. Could you see my fingers hitting those riffs, or was it blurry? I mean, <laughs> it both. Uh, both blurry and I could see it, but at the same time, I saw your fingertips like just the calluses just sh- shredding off there. I mean, you, you can't shred that hard. It's not sustainable to shred as hard as we just shredded, right? Um, and also, by the way, that drumming impressive. Thank you very much. Um, I've yet to break a stick, thankfully, but your guitar string budget is going to ruin this show, Eli, because every time you break a string, I know. And guys, can you tell me which part of the riff I broke that string on? And that reminds me, we need your support to keep the Gun Shop Show going. So if you'd like to sponsor the Gun Shop Show and get a unique advertisement and plug for your business, send an email to info at gunshopshow.com and we can hook you up with some sponsorship packages. But it is time, with no further ado... To get to checking the voicemail. You ready to roll on number one? Yeah, let me hear it. Here we go. Hi, Gun Shop Show. It's Jesse, a big fan. My question is the Polytechnic mass shooting in Canada, 1989, I think, led to major gun control in Canada. However, the gun that was used was the Ruger Mini-14. Now, it was actually not banned by the gun control that followed that mass shooting because it was marketed, it's been marketed um, historically as a hunting rifle. However, it uses the same ammunition and does as much damage as an AR-14. So I have a two-part question. First of all, does the Ruger Mini-14 have the capability of doing the same damage as an AR-15? Second part of my question is, do you think that marketing of firearms is really that powerful? Thanks. Keep up the good work. Love your show. All right, Jesse. Thank you for calling. We'll forgive you for saying AR-14 because you did. You came back and said AR-15, 
Secondly, also, I don't know how this voicemail was working. I didn't have the ear up to my the earpiece up to my ear. Yeah, you probably didn't hear like the what first five seconds. Of well, that luckily, so. luckily, the technology. Plus, there's just a little bit of um, specialness to this phone, and it just <laughs> it delivers. Uh, but okay, to recap that question: Is the Mini 14 the same as an AR, or how is it different, or how did it not get banned? Because it's just as uh, effective as the AR. So we'll break that down. And here behind me, if you're watching on the live stream, you see several ARs as well as um, a Mini 14 in the up there where the top of the phone is. Um, so the Mini 14 is a semi automatic uh, 223 slash 556 rifle, but it looks a lot more traditional. Um, it has a wooden stock. It has doesn't have a pistol grip uh, in its standard configuration. And so the question was, if that was used in the Canadian shooting, why did it not get banned? So first, let's talk about how it's the same and how it's different. It is not interchangeable. It is not a cousin to the AR-15. It's its own design. It's made by Ruger. It looks a lot like an M1 or an M14. So that's the Mini 14. It kind of has that look. Um, but it does not function like an AR in terms of uh, internal components. But to answer your question, it is capable of holding 30 round magazines, uh, up to 30 round magazines, and it is capable of delivering. 223 or 556 ammunition at about the same rate of fire uh, as an AR. So then that leads to the question, why didn't it get banned? And she asked, is marketing, is gun marketing that powerful? All marketing <laughs> is that powerful. Yeah, if it's um, if it's effect if it's good marketing, you got good marketers, then it's good marketing. So the gun industry actually is famously bad at marketing in comparison to other things. There's a lot of things in the gun industry that are kind of famously not well polished or good. But to answer your question, marketing in general is that powerful. Marketers convinced people that breakfast was the most important meal of the day it wasn't really based on any science it was based on people wanted to sell certain types of pastries and bacon and eggs and those lobbies got together to create television commercials with pictures of bacon and eggs and oatmeal and toast and milk and orange juice Ugh. and you're supposed to eat all that for breakfast um that a big hearty breakfast wasn't a part of people's routines until marketers got a hold of it. And yeah, and Saturday morning cartoons too. Yeah, exactly. So it's the same thing. Like the food pyramid, we like to think that well, that came from the government. That was marketers as well, penetrating even the regulatory industry to say, um, "You're supposed to eat sixty percent of your food. Supposed to be grain." And then it's been marketed to you that you're supposed to eat stuff like that for breakfast. Um, and truth is, if you want to follow the food pyramid and eat 60% grain, you're probably going to be fat and gassy and constipated, probably brain dead. And uh, it's not healthy, but marketers sold you on the fact that it was. So we'll come back and we'll break down, was it the marketing that kept that from being banned or was it something else right here on the gun shop show it would be one thing to just tell you about our deal of the week the 12 survivors pocket water filter but it would be even better just to show you we came down to the Spring River bottom where the water is famously bad and Trevor is going to get me some water. Let's get in there. Yeah, let's get some, get some dirtiness in there. Nice and dirty. Oh yeah. Look at all that gross. The 
let's get some out of this puddle. Scrape it in there nice and deep like. Scoop it. Oh yeah, look at all that nasty mud. Mmm, you think it'll taste like chocolate? Alright, our deal of the week, the 12 Survivors Pocket Water Filter filters out Salmonella, Giardia, pretty much every bad kind of bacteria and makes water completely safe to drink. I've got the little pre-filter on there, so here we go. <laughs> Actually, it's not bad. Like, it just tastes like regular water. Uh, that's really impressive. The 12 Survivors Pocket Water Filter is the deal of the week from Liberty Tree Guns. Getting it supports the gun shop show. You can get it on libertytreeguns.com. has some really cool features, and it makes even the nastiest water safe to drink. There's a pre-filter that really is just designed to get the sediment out. If the water's cleaner than this, you don't need the pre-filter. But it's also threaded, so that'll thread right onto a normal water bottle or soda bottle. So if you're in a survival situation, you could scoop out the water into a water bottle, thread this on top, carry it with you, and make it safe to drink. Or carry them separately, thread it on just when you need to drink. So get it, LibertyTreeGuns.com. Kids are curious by nature. Do your part to prevent unwanted tragedy from striking in your home by doing these simple tasks. Consider gun locks and or gun safes for storage of firearms. Don't leave your guns unattended where children could reach them. Discuss with your children the rules of firearm safety. Sign your kids up for hunter safety classes. Firearm safety in the household is your responsibility. Do your part to prevent unwanted tragedy from striking in your home. For more information, visit jaspercountysheriff.org. And we're back on the gun shop show, coming to you from the sales floor of your friends in the gun business, Liberty Tree Guns in Carthage, Missouri. And we were busy checking the voicemail. And our first uh, voicemail of the day was how did, and Mini 14, how was it different? We broke that sort of down. Um, it mostly looks different. And in fact, a lot of guys choosing a Mini 14 instead of an AR because of the perception if i have this riding around in my truck behind the seat in the window um is it going to be perceived as an aka assault rifle or is it going to be perceived as a good old boy's woodstock rifle and the truth is functionally uh, how many rounds you can fire how accurate it is there's not a lot of difference right the only real difference between the two i mean other than the fact that they are different is the fact that the AR is built for, you know, modular modularity, uh, lightness to be transported. But other than that, it fires relatively the same. Yeah, functionality and firing is about the same. So the question was, is it the marketing that kept that from getting banned? And the truth is, no, it's the lack of understanding and, quite honestly, um, research and effectiveness of gun control advocates right yeah in fact the very best thing for pro-gun arguments are the people making the anti-gun arguments in fact um there's some long-running jokes about the guy holding up the 30 caliber ghost gun with 30 caliber clips and he looks like an idiot because how is he going to profess to you that he knows what's best for you and your safety if he doesn't even know what he's talking about right you know he wants to ban something that he doesn't understand doesn't know how it works and so 
I think that contributes more toward um, whether or not it was looked over. Because when you read a lot of the bands, so-called assault weapon bands, they are listing features that they think are scary and Mm -hmm. associated with scary guns like the AR-15. So they list things including a heat shield, which is just a stamped piece of sheet metal with holes on it to go on the top of a shotgun to keep you from burning your hand. It makes it no more lethal. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's because advocates like Hank Williams, who is uh, not Hank Williams, Hank... Uh, uh, what's that guy's last name? I'm not sure. He's a uh, Hank. We covered it in the last show. He's the one um, promoting HR 5717, um, and he is a congressman. Hank Johnson. I yep. knew he was a Hank Johnson. Hank Johnson. Uh, he's the guy that thinks that we can't station soldiers on the island of Guam because it'll it, tip. Uh, it might flip over and capsize. Right. Well, I mean, if you think about it, Eli, it, it, this is just one instance of where politicians are making decisions for us based off of an, its ignorance, its lack of understanding and lack of knowledge. It has nothing to do with facts. So if they're making decisions for us or trying to make decisions for us about these things and they don't even know what other things would they be doing the same thing too exactly and so um you know thankfully they haven't been super effective because they become laughable and if someone is on the fence they don't really have a position on gun rights and they go to research the claims that um some of the advocates of gun control are making and they figure out that what they're even proposing doesn't makes sense it doesn't check out mm-hmm. um they're not going to be advocates for it so it has more to do with the incompetence of the people pushing it than i think the marketing right. uh, because there are plenty of tactical versions of the mini 14 mm-hmm. and uh if you just look up um ruger ranch rifle tactical ranch rifle is another term for mini 14 they've got them with adjustable stocks and uh, pistol grips, and then they start looking a lot more visually like the Ever 15. So, right. um, so plastic, black, bad, mm-hmm. wooden, good, S- safe, good. grandpa, good. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know something that kind of came to mind, Eli, while I was doing some research on this stuff is I do wonder, like, okay, so there's the AR-10, the AR-15. There's, uh, you know, uh, typically most of these are. They have some number in them, but there's the M14. It kind of would make sense why someone would think there's an AR14. If there's an AR15 and an M14, like how do you keep track of all those different numbers if you're not absorbed in it all the time? Oh, you don't. You don't. In fact, uh, there's there's been the long running joke that gun guys just sit around and talk to each other in letters and numbers, <laughs> and like the military. Yeah, it kind of sounds like that over time. Uh-huh. So, but the fun thing is, I always think it's fun to make fun of politicians. So that came uh, from Joe Biden. He misspoke and said AR-14. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because it's really funny to laugh at, but right. our caller, Jesse, she's referencing a Mini-14 right. in comparison to an AR-15. Right. And in one, she had the slip, and she said AR-14, mm-hmm. uh, but she, she corrected it later. So she, she knew the difference, but um, it is pretty funny, and we'll talk about that more because I think one of our voicemails is on that topic. But let's roll number two. It's time to get to it. Hi, this is Travis calling from Sarcoxy. Just wondering what your guys' thoughts were on these riots in these bigger cities and Second Amendment loving people stepping up to defend businesses and homes and any legal repercussions they might face if they shoot rioters or, you know, anything that pertains to that, what your guys' thoughts are on it. Thanks. So, um... The question is, first of all, what do we think about people who have stepped up to defend properties and businesses and people, uh, Second Amendment supporters, uh, during some of what's going on? First of all, that is what it's all about. If you advocate for uh, gun ownership in a free society, it's for this type of situation, among many others. And so... um, we're grateful that there are those people that have done that stepped up and we've seen it be just a major deterrent people standing there armed. It's a shame that we have to be in a situation where that's having to take place, but that is why those equalizers are so important. But then the second part of the question, 
what is the possible legal ramifications of defending against rioting and looting. So I'm not an attorney. What? I cannot give you legal advice. I'm not going to tell you what to do or what actions to take, although I will tell you what Missouri law specifically says in regards to self-defense and even more interestingly, the defense of property. Um, Missouri law says that a person may use physical force when and to the extent he or she reasonably believes physical force to be necessary to deter what he or she reasonably believes to be theft, uh, tampering, or property damage in any degree. So it says you can use force to defend your stuff. You don't have to just let people steal from you, tear out your windows. But then it specifically says that you may use deadly force only when otherwise justified under the law. So you can't just blanketly use deadly force in defense of property. Right. I always use the example of if I'm in the store and I look out on the parking lot and I see someone stealing out of, out of my truck, can I just crack the front door and blast them? <laughs> no, I absolutely couldn't do that. And, and it's obvious when you phrase it that way. But right. do I have to just let them? No. Absolutely not. And the... The premise is, well, we shouldn't shoot each other over property. Well, I don't have to just let him. I can go confront him. And if I do, and I can use, under the law, it says a person may use physical force when and to the extent he or she reasonably believes to be necessary. So if I say, hey, get away from my car, and that works, that's the amount of force that's necessary. If I have to physically drag someone out of the way, and then they turn around with a knife, that would be otherwise justified under the law. So, um, you are allowed to use deadly force, uh, obviously, in response to the immediate threat of serious physical injury or death. So, if someone's throwing a brick at you, if someone's coming toward you with a knife or a baseball bat or obviously a gun, the use of deadly force is justified. In Missouri... We also define deadly force as justifiable um, when there's the threat of a forcible felony. So a forcible felony is any time someone uses violence or the threat of violence to commit a crime. And we're going to be checking the voicemail, talking about current situations, current events, how that applies to you right here on your favorite program related to guns, at least I hope so, The Gun Shop Show. Hey everybody, Eli here, and I'm really excited to tell you that The Gun Shop Show is now brought to you by one of my favorite places on earth, located here in my hometown of Carthage on the beautiful historic square, and that is the Emporium on the square and the Woodshed. It's an art gallery, an event center, a gift shop. They have art classes. And probably my favorite part is the burger and steak joint in the back. But when you walk in, you're in this 150-year-old great big building. And there's very unique Americana artwork from famous artists like Andy Thomas. They handle a lot of his originals and do framing for him. And it just has this incredible old school vibe and you can feel the history coming through you have to check out the art gallery but then as you work your way to the back into my favorite part that's the woodshed i've spent a lot of nights and had a lot of great meals in here they've got burgers they have uh, catfish i love their catfish it's excellent um chicken and waffles even it's incredible and uh it's also a music venue. So this year or last year, we got to see my favorite band of all time, the Ben Miller band. This is a photo that you're seeing that I took and uh, the ceiling was literally raining down. They were rocking so hard, but the best thing about it is not only is this my favorite place on earth, but it's owned by one of my favorite people on earth. That's Cherry Babcock. And she is the real deal. She takes care of her customers while they're hosting an event or catering or having a special art class or just 
their normal business of selling burgers and steaks, check out the Emporium on the Square and the Woodshed. Welcome back to the Gun Shop Show. The topic of today's show is all about ARs. And ARs are probably the single most popular firearm category or platform out there if you have to put every kind of AR, and there's so many variations and flavors under one umbrella, it is a huge part of the gun industry in the United States. Um, Although I think it was a little bit of a bubble because they became very popular in about the 2006, 7, 8 Obama uh, administration periods Mm -hmm. and tons of manufacturers. I'm talking hundreds of individual manufacturers that make AR-15s and variations of that popped up. And uh, we've seen that sort of ebb and flow and kind of peaked out. And then there's still tons of manufacturers and specialty ones. And everybody's putting their own spin, their own variation. There's tons of options. Everything from super high-end options like what you saw in the open of the show is a fairly high-quality brand in Q Firearms. Tell us a little bit about the gun you were shooting, Logan. So the gun I was shooting was the Q Sugar Weasel. It's an AR-15. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't have a chuckle with the name. The name's name. getting me, yeah. Um, it's a, so it's a, it's a higher-end AR. It features a, a better barrel, a better handguard than you typically get. Uh, the trigger's better. Uh, some of the anodizing that they did is a little better, and some of the furniture is better. And that's kind of what you get as you spend more money on ARs. You get little improvements that don't necessarily make the price justified. But uh, that's with all things. There's diminishing returns. We get questions all the time about, like, what what's the difference between a cheap AR and a expensive AR? Won't, won't they both shoot? Yes. It's a lot like, what's the difference between a um, Chevy Cavalier and a Mercedes-Benz? Like, will they both start and go? Yes. Will they both take you from A to B? Yes. Uh, will one last longer than the other? Yes. Will one be a nicer experience when you do drive it? Yes. And that's a lot of the way that some of these higher-end AR-15s are. And it falls all over the map as far as what I feel like you're getting. There's some brands that uh, customers love and a certain demographic, the features they get, they love that for the price. And I might think, you know, I don't feel like it's justified to pay that much more. Or in other cases, um, there are some where I feel like you get a lot for the money. So uh, we're going to continue breaking that down. One quick reminder is make sure that you grab your Liberty Tree Guns merch. If you go to Liberty Tree Guns and click the merch section, you get our t-shirts um here's a couple flavors you can show mine and if uh my switcher is broken so you're gonna have to switch on to there it is show that off that's the don't tread on me version of the liberty tree guns um logo and you can get that we also encourage you please 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 super please share the feed if you're watching this on facebook or youtube make sure you click share Uh, You can stay right in the feed and share that and help us grow the show. Also, if you would like to be on the show or contribute to the show or discuss the show, um, you can join the Gun Shop Show Facebook page. Uh, I'm sorry, Gun Shop Show Facebook group, which is kind of a community that we've built. We've had a lot of fun. We went live on a range day, so Mm -hmm. when we were out there shooting the Sugar Weasel and some other variations, we were live answering questions out on the range. And that was a ton of fun. Uh, So join that there to get in on the conversation. But it's time to go back to check in the voicemail. Let's get ready to roll the next one. My name is Jake from Joplin. I just wanted to know what your thoughts were. If you uh, you had a preference, do you prefer uh, a direct impingement or piston gas system, such as the PWS, and why? Thanks. All right, so... He wants to know basically the functionality of an AR, and there's there's more than two, but there's two major ways that AR-15s are designed, the original way and an adaptation that uh, is the piston-driven system. So 
before I break it down, Logan, do you have, you don't have to explain why, do you have a preference? Yes, actually I do. Um, I prefer direct impingement. Okay, so I'm going to break that down. I think we have a visual thing that will assist us. If you can get that ready for me, Trevor. So let's talk about how an AR-15 functions. So direct impingement is the original gas blowback design that allows an AR to fire in a semi-auto function. So you have the bolt carrier group, and if you're watching on screen, we're going to have a animation that's going to sort of show this visually. Round goes in the chamber, and when it ignites, you get all of that gas, that explosion traveling down the barrel, obviously driving the projectile out, but then it there's a little hole in the top of the barrel, and through that comes the gas pressure, at least a portion of it. Obviously, the majority of it drives the projectile out of the barrel then the other portion goes up into what's called the gas block which on a lot of rifles the gas block is built into the front sight and then it travels down a little straw to the bolt carrier group so it comes back toward the shooter inside the uh, gas tube and drives the bolt backwards and then springs push it back forward so it's a very simple thing the gas pressure from the round blows the bolt backwards, picks up another round, and repeats. So now we're going to break down a piston-driven system. It's the same concept. There's just a piston in between the uh, gas escaping from the barrel to the bolt. So let this pull up for just a second give you the visual aid so the same thing if you're not seeing the video the projectiles coming down the barrel obviously this is instantaneous but we're watching a slow version of it for representation purposes a little bit of gas escapes into a chamber above the barrel and instead of just the gas traveling through a piston that's connected to the bolt drives the bolt back and repeats the process that's interesting. So uh, this is not a... The, the piston system is not the way the original AR-15 or M16 was designed. But there are some advantages to it. So that's probably all we need on that visual. Um, the, the answer to your question is which do I prefer? On an AR-15, I actually prefer direct impingement. Because if I want a piston operating system, I will get one of the ones that are designed that way Mm -hmm. originally, like the AK. The AK has a piston, same premise, the gas coming down the barrel drives the piston back. But that piston and that system makes the gun heavier. And one of the things, although a full disclaimer, you saw it in the AK episode, I actually prefer AKs for um, a, a battle rifle. It's my preference. But the thing that I do like about ARs is how light they are. So the thing that attracts me to building an AR or owning an AR um, is the fact that you can get them down to half the weight of an AK. So if I'm going to have a piston system, uh, which the advantages to a piston system is you don't have to clean your gun as often because that gas and all of the fouling, the burnt gunpowder that helps drive that back down the gas tube is not directly interfacing with the rest of your gun. It's hitting the piston and the piston's driving it back. So you can shoot more rounds with less need to clean your gun, less worry about that powder fouling. And so if I want that, if I want that piston system, I'm going with um, something like an AK that's originally designed that way it's going to be a little heavier anyway as far as weight of the gun but if i want an ar if for me personally if i'm taking an interest in that i want lightweight and thankfully with a lot of improvements that they've made with um nickel boron bolt carrier groups and things that help the gun function even with a lot of rounds fired 
you can get them to be pretty dang reliable for mm -hmm. quite a few rounds. And most people don't mind to clean their gun every once in a blue moon anyway. Give you a reason to clean it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I hope that's a, a decent answer for you. I appreciate your call, Jake. Let's do the next voicemail. This is Kirk from Carthage. How do we educate people on AR-15s? You know, hopefully now with seeing the riots and um, unrest, the the gun debate of like personal gun ownership of a AR-15 or any kind of high high magazine capacity weapon are kind of more understood um, of why we need them, but. You know, it, it, it almost offends me to my core when I see people call um, any rifle an automatic weapon. And, you know, seeing education on that would be very helpful, um, I think, for the, for the debate on what kind of firearms people should be able to own. All right, so the question is, how do we educate people on AR-15s and why they're important to own? I can give you a really short answer. Have them watch The Gun Shop Show. <laughs> so now is a good time and a good reminder of why we need AR-15s. Stay with us on The Gun Shop Show. Hey podcast listeners and live stream viewers, I wanted to let you know that The Gun Shop Show is made possible by our friends at MidAmerica RV. Being in the customer service industry, I have a really high standard for how customers are treated. MidAmerica RV does it right. I've got my RV through their dealership and I've taken it all over the country. Uh, we made it to South Padre Island, We've gone to Colorado several times. And if you've ever owned an RV, you know there's a lot that comes with it. So who you get it from matters. And it's extremely important that you have support after the sale. And here's some photos of my trips to Colorado that uh, we took in our RV from MidAmerica RV. Uh, they're located just outside of Carthage. They have a really vast inventory and they are home of... Uh, the lifetime RV warranty. So uh, I believe they call it a forever warranty. So I urge you, if you're in the market for one, to check them out. Uh, it's a really fun and can be very affordable way to uh, get your trips in. So visit them at midamericarv.com. Uh, we appreciate their support of the Gun Shop Show. And as you can see, they have a large inventory selection of trailers and fifth wheels, and they specialize in those. They don't carry any motorhomes or anything like that. So if you are in the market for a tow-behind RV of any size, from a little teardrop to uh, a full-size trailer, uh, I urge you to check out MidAmerica RV. Now, we weren't sent any promotional material so we decided and this is from uh, genuinely from my personal experience there's a trip of me in Colorado in my surveyor that I got from MidAmerica RV and so we decided we would make our own commercial for these guys since we believe in them so much so Trevor I assume that you are prepared with material right uh, I'm gonna jingle on the spot that you didn't make one ahead of time. I didn't. No, I didn't. Um, right. And I'm actually a little nervous right now. Can you put it on the lot? Yes, I can. Okay. All, All right. right. Let's hear it. Let's refresh. And here we go. They may not appreciate this. Mid-America RV. The San Francisco treat. What? That doesn't make sense. Uh... Yeah, I'm not so hot at the making up of stuff, so I borrow from other people. Okay, well, <laughs> the point is, MidAmerica RV will treat you right. If you're in the market for a travel trailer or fifth wheel, check out MidAmerica RV. The Gun Shop Show, the Gun Shop Show, what is it? We don't know. The Gun Shop Show, the Gun Shop Show, here we go, it's the Gun Shop Show. 
All right, welcome back to the real party, which is right here on the live stream of the Gun Shop Show. This party's about ready to be on the radio soon. Yes. Which uh, means we're going to have to clean it up. We're going to have to get no. it together. So, um, just to give you an idea, if you're coming to us from the radio, say hi, please, in the comments. And again, take a second to share the feed, because we've got some really good AR-related stuff coming up. And when you share the feed, it helps make the show successful we sure appreciate you let us know if you came here from the radio we uh, what we noticed was that we were just getting rolling Mm -hmm. and then we had to say hey if you're listening on the radio come to the feed because this is the end of the radio and uh the radio station are uh nice hosts at news talk kzrg they noticed that too Mm -hmm. and they said you know what we want more gun shop show. More gun shop show. And I so, want more gun shop show. Yeah, I do too. And we've got a lot more for you today. But also, coming up on the radio um, soon, I don't know an exact date, we'll announce it in the gun shop show Facebook group when we do know. You'll, You'll at have, least be the first people to know, right? Yeah. So you can always get the full podcast, so don't sweat it. If you're a, a Facebook or YouTube or podcast listener, and the podcast is available on uh, Stitcher, uh, Apple, Apple uh, iTunes, uh, iTunes, Google Play Music, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spotify, Spotify is one too. iHeartRadio, Tune In, Podbean, Podbean, Podbean. Yep, Podbean. We, got, Podbean. we got Podbean followers, by the way. What? <laughs> yeah. So if you are listening on any of those platforms, thank you, thank you, thank you. If there's a rating system on that platform, please consider giving us a good rating. Please. Or if you don't want to give us a good rating please send us an email to info at gunshopshow.com and let us know what we could do to earn that good rating. Yeah, we want to be better. Yeah, we want we to make do. this for you. That's why we're doing it. This is for you. Um, and But if you're listening on those platforms, you're always going to get the full show. The live stream and the, and the um, podcasts are always a full thing, no matter what. Sometimes we've had two and a half, three hour shows. Um, you're going to get that. Okay, so don't sweat it regardless but now we're going to have two full hours on the radio which will help uh, get the word out that much more so right before the break we had a caller and they asked how do we educate people on the ar-15s so that they know um you know that they shouldn't be banned or that they're important to own well thankfully 2020 is doing a darn good job of showing us why you just might want to have a modern, effective way to defend yourself. Right. Uh, peace of mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one of the things that's interesting is we have seen an influx of people who didn't feel the need to be armed until now, mm-hmm. coming in, wanting education, wanting to purchase a firearm. So that's the silver lining. We may be growing the base of second amendment supporting self-defense supporting people so i think what point the caller was trying to make though is like these guns aren't fully automatic and therefore you shouldn't have an argument against them um well the truth is i don't go down that road i don't debate what the gun is capable of doing and therefore you should or shouldn't be able to own it Because I believe that we as human beings have an inherent right to defend ourselves with whatever mechanism we may need to. Right. And in a situation where you do need to defend yourself, you're not thinking whether or not this thing that you're going to use is right or wrong. You're thinking, I need to save my life. Yeah, exactly. And so when we start saying, well... I should be able to own it because it's only capable of this, or I shouldn't be able to own it because it's capable of that, you're undermining the argument that being armed and sometimes equivalently to other forces at play, like the state, I make the argument that you are inherently entitled to that. You don't get... The Second Amendment is great that that's codified in the United States Constitution. But you don't get your gun rights from the Second Amendment. You're born with an inherent native human right to defend yourself. 
and owning and possessing and knowing how to use firearms is part of that. It doesn't come from the government. It doesn't come from any document, whether old or new. You have the right to do that. And we have to maintain that belief and that argument. And we have to be good stewards of that sentiment. Because if we don't, if we don't showcase as a society that we are capable of doing that and that we're better off for it, we're going to lose the debate. And when gun owners go to the defense of others, not in an offensive or aggressive way, but a using the Second Amendment as it was intended to deter unlawful force, unjustified, unwarranted force, it's a good example of that. However, when people use firearms in a violent, aggressive way, it undermines that argument. So there has to be more of us doing it right and exercising that right, not just buying a firearm and putting it in a box under your bed. Buying a firearm, training with that firearm, carrying that firearm, having it ready, and then doing things to exemplify what it means to be a free person in a free society and the importance of gun ownership in that picture. The United States became what it was today not because we just got lucky. It's because the first time in, in, or at least the greatest time in history, we figured out that more freedom, and it hasn't been perfect, but more freedom for the individual, not the collective, we found that when you protect the individual, you protect the collective because individual rights are collective rights in a free society. So when each person has a right to defend themselves, we have a more polite society and a protection of that freedom. When we don't safeguard that, it's when things fall apart. And we've seen it all across the globe. We've seen it in... Uh, third world countries and right now across our country it looks like a third world country and that's a shame it shouldn't you're right it shouldn't unfortunately uh, it is the uh, it happens you it, know, these things do happen and it's sad that it does happen but it does remind us of how good we have it when things go bad we've had it good for a long time and I think that's the other thing is um, someone asked about marketing unfortunately a lot of your news is marketing. Right. Yeah, it is. It's either making you angry at the other side or happier with your side. So even um, right now we're being told that everything is bad and that there's no hope. But I'd say most news. Most, most news all the yeah, time. is how bad it is. It's and either they're trying to take your rights away or they're coming to get you. It's just nonstop negativity. And... Right now, at this moment, there's closer to being an argument for it. But overall, in the, in the context of the world and the context of history, we still have it better than most people historically. Yeah, you're right. Um, overall, in terms of how safe we are, mm -hmm. in terms of um, what the opportunities are, but... I think it's really funny as I've seen in the last few days people the world today or in this world we live in this or that and I've even seen people I know it's the end of times because these things are happening right that's you think the people during Nazi Germany didn't think it was the end of times <laughs> man in my life I have lived through numerous end of the world days. Like literally, like they're announcing on the radio, like it was uh, determined that today would be the last day on earth. It's, people are crazy, man. Well, what's uh, really interesting is uh, we own some historic buildings downtown uh, here in Carthage. And in the process of researching the history of those properties, we've pulled out newspapers and mm -hmm. news articles uh, whenever the building's referenced or whatever, but you can go back at any point 
I'm talking 1890s, 1920s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and you will find comments either by reporters or quotes from citizens of, yeah, but in the world we live in today, right. they're complaining that the world is crazy and bad and the worst it's ever been in every decade. Right. And now we pine back to the day <laughs> right. that they were quoting being <laughs> when the world was terrible. So right. that's a human nature. Statistically, you know, I don't know what the last few days or weeks play into this. I'm sure it's a blip in what I'm about to say. Right. But if you look at the graph, in your likelihood to be targeted for violent crime, it just goes straight down from the 1970s. Yeah, there's a little, like, this year will be up a little bit, but the overall graph trends down. You're less likely to be the victim of a violent crime today than at any point in history historically in the United States. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, play the next one. Let's see. Which one are we on here? Number five? Number five, five. yeah. Here we go. Number five. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Gabe. I'm calling from Carthage, right next door to Liberty Tree, actually. Just in the times that we live in, uh, given the circumstances and the state of the United States and people buying firearms uh, and extra ammunition, what is the most practical caliber of handgun and or rifle to own, um, whether it be in a self-defense scenario um, or things are going south and you need to either protect your family or provide for your family in the wilderness, uh, what's available during a crisis, what is always available, even if it's more expensive ammo, what calibers uh, are the most accessible during times of um, craziness in either the firearms industry or politics. All right, so the question is, what do you stockpile and what is a good idea to keep around? So... Um, there's some interesting ways to approach that. One is, let's just start by talking about from a use standpoint, not what's going to be available, just what would be practical if you could only have one thing. And uh, honestly, the AR-15 is a good candidate for that. If you, uh, heaven forbid, things really get the worst they've ever been, at least in our lifetimes, Mm -hmm. and you... Uh, don't have the comforts of normal society, normal things, which there's people experiencing that right now. You can only leave the house with the one thing you can carry. What would that be? Um, A intermediate cartridge rifle, and I'm going to pick up the 7.62x39 and the 223 cartridge. Hold them up by the camera. Those are good options. Why? They make great self-defense calibers. They also make uh, respectable hunting rounds. So you could take game, um, everything from small to medium-sized game, deer, uh, and things like that with those calibers. So good Mm multi-use. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and also, I mean, I'm sure that those are very popular rounds and, and plenty of them to be had. So, yes, but also because of the commonality and the common occurrence of people using those for those circumstances, right. they're also likely to sell out. So uh, yeah. um, that's, I think, part of the caller's question is, what do you get so that it doesn't go out of stock? Well, first of all, I always recommend to panic early. <laughs> right. <laughs> panic when no one else is panicking. Uh, because then you can stockpile and make sure you have enough to where you don't have to make those purchases when everyone else is trying to make them. But that's the same for any commodity. And sometimes it's the scarcity itself that drives the sales, uh, a.k.a. example, toilet paper. <laughs> toilet paper. So uh, I, I got a good chuckle out of the toilet paper debacle. People would say, what do... Uh, or they would come to tell me a story. They'd say, I can't believe this toilet paper situation. People are hoarding it for no reason. Those stupid toilet paper hoarders. 
yesterday when I was in line buying toilet paper. <laughs> right. <laughs> so like they're... Self-fulfilling prophecy sort of situation. So the, the, situ- the idea is a product disappears from the shelves or there's a limited amount of it and you think it, it's... This is it kind of ties back into the marketing of it. It puts mm-hmm. it in people's mind. It's not that people aren't smart enough to think about owning a gun or not smart enough to think about having enough toilet paper. It's just they only give it a certain amount of their attention unless something forces that to change, right? So you only think about toilet paper when you're down to your last couple rolls or however it is that you manage that. Right. But if you saw 14 Facebook posts and a 15-minute CNN segment about how there's no toilet paper and Charmin's working around the clock and (laughs) we don't know when it's going to happen again, it's on your consciousness more. It's the same thing with ammo. It's like, I think I have enough to feel comfortable, Mm -hmm. but... I don't really know, and I don't want that guy to get the last of it. I want to be the guy to get the last of it. And so it sort of exacerbates um, an already acute problem. But it's also the market sort of um, naturally reduces the supply to the minimum amount in the pipeline that it can get by with. So the merchant's best practice normally is to keep the least amount on hand that he can replenish it effectively. Right. So to break it down simply, if it were possible to only for, for a seller like Walmart, I mean, Walmart's kind of a bad example because everyone thinks of them as a conglomerate, but you just think Joe Schmo's grocery store, if he had a way to only pay for his wholesaler's toilet paper one roll at a time. And he knew that one customer would come in and buy it, and then he would have time to put another roll in its place. He would only sock one roll of toilet paper. Right, yeah. And it's the same thing with every other product, because it costs money to, to have it sit there on yeah, the shelf. tied up in inventory on their shelf. And, I mean, some of it's perishable. I don't know about mm-hmm. toilet paper, but, yeah, I mean, they're only going to manufacture it to the market demand. Right, and rent costs money and the way that rent gets paid is how how the things that set on the floor generate right um money so you're not going to put more of it taking up x amount of space Mm -hmm. than you have to in order to get through one cycle so what we find is when there's a big spike in demand like there is right now with toilet paper or there is with ammunition everybody down the supply chain can only supply the normal amount. Right, Right, and they can't just spin up new machines or, you know, hire new people to be over there and craft some quilted northern. They don't have, like, a a factory full of old ladies, like, making quilted northern, quilting it together. Right. (laughs) What happens, though, is to some degree that does happen. If the demand spikes up, then manufacturers say, wow, we could make this amount of sales Mm -hmm. if we could make it. So what they do is they tool up and they get it going, and then they supply that, and then that issue of everyone being aware and concerned of whether they're going to get enough goes away because right. we've met that demand. Mm-hmm. So then it goes back down, and then instead of keeping those machines running all the time or even keeping those machines in existence, it's cheaper to sell them off and go back down to meet the demand. So there's right. always this ebb and flow, and that we've seen that in the gun industry, and um, we've done our very best to keep our markup the same. And I can't say we've always kept our price the same because sometimes our price changes. But a lot of people have the perception that there's price gouging going on. Or, yeah. But sometimes that's not the case. And Logan made the point yesterday is it's not that 9 millimeter went way up or it doubled. It's just all the stuff that used to sell for twelve fifty a box is gone. That was the first thing to sell, right? When everyone stocked mm-hmm. up, all of that sold out. So there's some specialty stuff that sells for $20 a box. It didn't sell out as fast. But to the end consumer that walks in and says, I want some 9 millimeter," and they're expecting that normal price, uh, 
all they see is the $20 box left. And sometimes maybe we wouldn't even have stocked that $20 box in the past. Yeah. But because we don't want to be the gun store with no 9 millimeter, we say we'll take everything we can get our hands on. Right. And now the only thing on the shelf is $20 mm -hmm. uh, specialty, whether it's mm -hmm. hollow points or sometimes it's just um, other flavors of those SKUs. Right. So it's a perceived in uh increasing in price as opposed to an actual it's not like that box that was twelve dollars is now twenty four or thirty eight or forty six or whatever right and there's some of that that goes on because uh -huh. um you know some suppliers don't think about their long term health they think about oh I can make more money on this and they do yeah. adjust the price but that's probably the minority right most mm -hmm. of the time it's just the cheap stuff sold out here's this right. So, um, to answer the main question, it really comes down to personal preference, but to give you an idea, 9mm is my handgun caliber of choice. Um, it's good effectiveness, good capacity, affordability to shoot on a normal day. But within the last two years, when I saw the cost of 40 caliber, 40 Smith & Wesson firearms going way down as their popularity dropped, still a very good caliber and I see you can buy the guns cheap um, and the other benefit is when nine millimeter sells out there's usually still some 40 on the shelf because there's not as many people clamoring for it right so I picked up a couple of uh, police surplus trade-in Glock 22s and some 40 ammo just knowing that I'm more likely to be able to have that even as a person that tries to, to have enough in every caliber now i know supply chain wise that's going to be a good backup plan for me so uh the short answer is stock what you think you'll need um and figure out what makes sense outside of that in terms of is it worth stocking this just in case there's a shortage most people get comfortable and say no they don't really need it when times are good and then it's times like this where they wish that they would have stocked up so in this sense uh, a practical caliber is relative to the individual yeah i think so um i think the intended use versus what the round is capable of you know a lot of people stock up on 22 long rifle mm -hmm. um it's really good on the game gathering side it's really good in the fact that you could put 2,000 rounds in a backpack pretty easily where you couldn't put 2,000 rounds of 5.56 five, or, or 7.62 without really being weighed down um, but then again it's not nearly as effective for personal defense right. you're not likely to take down a deer or something like that with a 22 long rifle so everything like most things in life has its trade-offs um, but another good one is shotguns. Mm -hmm. uh, 12 gauge shotguns are a really adaptable survival uh, firearm because of the variety of loads that you can get for it. So the 12 gauge uh, slug is a great big bullet, very good at taking down a threat or taking down a deer or a bear. Yeah. Um, but you can also put bird shot, making it really effective to shoot something as small as a bird or a rabbit. Um, Quite versatile. Yeah, they? they make yeah. everything from flare signal rounds. When you see in a movie when um, they're in a boat or something and they're trying to signal that they're in trouble, they pull out a little orange plastic gun. Mm -hmm. When you look at those cartridges, those are 12-gauge shotgun shells. They can be loaded into a 12-gauge pump shotgun or a double-barrel shotgun and fired off and uh so there's all kinds of variety of uh shells for that so a 12 gauge shotgun would be a good option you know there's a reason that uh police refer to 12 gauge shotguns as riot guns because they're pretty effective you can load less lethal rounds you can load buckshot you can load bird shot you can load slugs so those would be a couple options that i would have you consider I think four and five or five and six got out of order compared to that. It may have been my fault when I did that, but let's uh, roll the next one and see which one it is. 
this is Terry Pablo. I'm calling from Joplin. Uh, I just want to know more about uh, Joe Biden's AR-14s. Uh, maybe where can I get one? Or is uh, a double-barreled shotgun adequate? Thanks. <laughs> so this is an inside joke. Uh, well, not necessarily inside joke, but it's a joke that you have to have seen the exchange. Um, it's actually pretty funny. Joe Biden was at a political rally. I assume his, I don't know if it was a town hall, what it was, but there were auto workers unions there. And an auto worker union worker asked him about gun rights. So this is kind of a conflict for uh, the Democrat Party and positions on guns because you have these union blue-collar factory workers that would typically vote Democrat, but they're also the kind of person that wants to own a gun and not have their gun rights threatened. So he asked Joe Biden uh, about some comments that he'd made about taking the guns, and Joe Biden flies off the handle and says, you, don't, you can't own a machine gun. You don't need an AR-14. And everyone made fun of him because it's, it's, there's no such thing as an AR-14. Right. They're AR-15s. Well, there wasn't until now. <laughs> it's happening. You can be the exclusive owner of a limited number of Crazy Uncle Joe's <laughs> AR-14. I'm going to grab it. You guys practice your keeping the air alive while I slide away from the desk. Okay? Oh my God. I don't want it to be dead silent from the time I roll backwards to the time I get back. All right. Okay. So, hey, Logan. Hey, what's up, man? How's it going? It's pretty good. That's cool. Yeah, how you doing? I'm doing good. I had a good time shooting your sweet weasel, or what was sugar it? Sugar weasel? Sugar plum? <laughs> oh. Sweet weasel. Is that, <laughs> is that the smooch edition? It's actually considered the poor man's honey badger, which is oh. another rifle they make. The poor man, nothing from Q is for a poor man. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. What's the price point on the sugar weasel? $14.99. Also, guys, thank you. You're welcome. A little bit of feedback. A little bit of feedback. Just yeah. a little oh, bit of... Oh, um, on our back and forth? Oh, you you uh, get triggered when you hear the word feedback. Well, I was, I was Tre- like, I don't hear no feedback. <laughs> Trevor, Trevor's uh, <laughs> audiovisual role here makes him <laughs> flinch when I say the word feedback. No, here's a little bit of constructive criticism. Okay. When I roll away and I say keep it going, uh-huh. I mean talk to the audience. Oh, what? Oh, okay. Not talk to each other in well, a you're candid. It live. We were just chilling in a candid, <laughs> casual um, discussion. I'm glad that you <laughs> kept it uh, f- radio friendly. But this is just things that happen here at the gun shop, man. All right, this look. This is real right now. I want you to see this. This is. A gun available right now from Liberty Tree Guns. This is Crazy Uncle Joe's (laughs) AR-14. I was like, what's with the hands? Three, two, one. Oh, I get it. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, what's with the hands? I saw a meme uh, when the the COVID-19 was really sparked off. Mm -hmm. um, And it was Joe Biden. As Somebody got an actual candid shot of him staring out a window. And he's looking all... uh, is the word forlorn? Uh, maybe. Mm. I don't know if Could it's be. the word, but it's a word. What's that word mean, forlorn? Uh, he's looking like he's, not longingly, but like... Pitifully sad and abandoned or lonely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, that's it was it. Joe Biden staring Hopeless. out the window, and it says, uh, when you're not allowed to touch someone or sniff them <laughs> <laughs> because of the uh, the quarantine situation it'd be great if they were interviewing him and he was like putting his own hands on his own shoulders <laughs> so that uh you can get one of uh, i love that they made 2020 right of these and that's number one huh no, no. this is just one of that i don't oh. know if it's um uh, i don't know if it gives you the sequence of which one this is but i'm sure the serial numbers are probably some sort of sequence yeah probably. but this is one of 2020 crazy uncle joe's ar-14 and time will tell i mean i think this will be an interesting little tidbit mm-hmm. whether joe biden loses and we forget 
that he said this. Well, either way, doesn't that mean there's now an AR-14? Yeah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> like, uh, that didn't exist until now. Now it does. Thanks, Uncle Joe. Thanks, uh, crazy cre- Uncle Joe. Creepy Uncle Joe. <laughs> You're the best. Touchy Uncle Joe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, Gross. thanks, Terry. Now, to the second part of your question. Is a double-barrel shotgun um, adequate? So, another famous thing, and uh, I made fun of it early. I want to take credit if you go back, there's a three guns in three minutes video where I edited together a real clip. I edited it together to be funny, mm-hmm. but where he says, you don't need a machine gun. You don't need an AR-15. Buy a shotgun. He's like, I told Jill, I think it's Jill, right? His yeah. wife. I said, uh, step out on the porch fire two blasts <laughs> and so i'm like okay yo, you're telling her she only gets two shots and then you're telling her to expend her <laughs> only two shots into the air yeah, that's not good thinking that uh, is not good advice no you're gonna need something that's gonna give you more than two rounds if you're gonna <laughs> blast off your only two rounds so uh i went to look the clip up so i could answer terry's question about is a double barrel shotgun adequate and somebody has taken the torch and ran with that answer. So let me get this straight. You didn't want to take credit or you are taking credit? Because um, I think you said, I don't want to take credit for this, but... But I did it before this guy. Oh, well, yours was yours was a little more uh, in sync Oh, yeah, yeah, there was an insane (laughs) baby bye-bye-bye in that one. I'm surprised YouTube hasn't taken that down. They may have. I don't know. Well, I don't think we're monetizing it, so Yeah, so the, um, yep, yeah, so like I said, we're coming to you from the sales floor, and I'm going to answer Remington's question right now, live on the show. We can order any Black Rain products. From the catalog, there may be a lead time. In turn, we'll have to check with them. But if it's in the 2020 catalog, we can hook them up. That was Remington, everybody. Yes, his real name is Remington. Mm-hmm. We did not name him that. His mama named him that. Mm-hmm. I assume it was his mama. Hopefully, Rem- it was his mama. Remington, your mama named you that. It's probably his dad, Ruger. Probably his dad, Ruger. I like how I ask him questions and then I have headphones on and I can't hear him <laughs> the answer. Uh, anyway, no, I'm not taking credit. I mean, it's a ridiculous statement. Anybody could have made fun of it. I'm just saying I actually edited together content mm-hmm. of this early on. You remixed it. But like so many things, for example, like your classic example of oh rolling by gosh. rolling on the river. By the famous... <laughs> Wait a second. That was a, que- that was a question of wh- who wrote it first. I wasn't claiming that Tina Turner wrote it. Uh, you were saying that she did such a better job of rolling on the river than what? Credence. I didn't say that. I'd never say that. <laughs> I'd never say that about Credence. Uh, I would never say that about Credence. So uh, I, s- I sang a bit of rolling on the river, and Trevor said... That's a Tina Turner song. I said, it is. No, it is not. <laughs> she sang it. She might have covered I, it. Well, just so when you sing Rolling on a River, Eli, you sound like the Tina Turner version. <gasps> really? Uh, yeah. Wow. <sighs> well, we'll have to put that to it's, the test later. <laughs> <laughs> it's your face. Oh. You, you make the Tina Turner face. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, last night, Facebook wouldn't load a picture. And it just had like the metadata mm-hmm. up the, and it said person, person standing, person standing with beard. And then just the broken image uh, link thing. That's in bots. And I thought it was funny that that's, I didn't know what it was until I finally got it to load, but it's a picture of me, but Facebook had boiled it down uh-huh. to person, person standing. I was standing right here on the set pointing at the new gun oh, display yeah. and it, it just person standing with beard. So, like, all three of them, there's just one person. That was you, but it was defining you It was, like, different scenarios. tags. It yeah. was just, like, this photo yeah. contains person, person standing, person standing with beard. Hmm. Anyway, so this guy, like Trevor's beloved Tina Turner, took an original idea and made it even better. 
Uh, I don't know. Just like Tina Turner? I you said that. Those are your words. I think you said that. <laughs> what? Yeah, you just basically said that Tina Turner's version is better. No, I don't think that. Well, exactly you'll have, we'll just, just have to replay it later. Okay, this guy's version of Crazy Uncle Joe shotgun comments. Top shelf. You ready to roll that beautiful bean footage? Play it. <laughs> I have two shotguns on my home. They're locked in a safe. There's a metal gun case. We live in an area that's wooded, somewhat secluded. And I said, Jill, if there's ever a problem, just walk out on the balcony and fire two blasts outside the house. Buy shotgun. Buy shotgun. You don't need a machine gun. You don't need 30 rounds. Buy shotgun. Buy double barrel shotgun. And you don't need a tank And you don't need an AR-15 To scare those thugs away No, and I don't need a grenade launcher I don't need an F-15 There's just one thing I need to do And they'll stay away from me Fire two blasts outside the house Buy a shotgun Buy a shotgun Buy a shotgun Oh man, that's uh, called the Buy a Shotgun song, Joe Biden on YouTube. Um, that's from Songify the News. Full credit to those guys. Um, we appreciate uh, their ability to uh, let us play that back and get a good laugh at the expense of one of the presidential candidates. <laughs> Um, so obviously if I have an angry mob destroying an entire section of my town, would I want to fire two blasts or maybe I would want the option of having more rounds. I think I definitely would prefer to have the ability to fire thir uh, 30 rounds or more, right. uh, instead of firing two blasts There's <laughs> proof Proof is happening right now, the firing two blasts. Right. I mean, if you're only dealing with two people and you are an eagle eye, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, Three people, you got problems. <laughs> yeah, you got problems. <laughs> uh, so thanks, Terry. Uh, come get your AR-14. Double barrel shotguns have their place, and we do have them at libertytreeguns.com, and many times we have them on the sales floor. So check those out, and let's roll the next voicemail. Well, hello. This is Vladimir calling once again from Moscow, Russia, Mother Russia. Um, I'm calling in concerns with you saying, uh, asking questions for AR-15s. Uh, my question for AR-15 is, why is AR-15 uh, sub, sub gun, uh, this not as good <laughs> as AK-47? The Kalashnikov is much uh, superior firearm. I'd like to know why America is so obsessed with the uh, AR-15 platform of firearms to use. Uh, anyway, can you throw AR in mud and still fire rocks? I don't think so, Mr. Timmy. Uh, so, God bless, uh, you know, countries and things and communisms. <laughs> communisms. <laughs> so I should point out that we did not plant that. That's a real listener. Uh, I don't know if he's really Russian. I don't either. But we would never plant voicemails anyway. We just so the audience knows, we'd never do that. But the <laughs> idea that he took it upon himself to call twice from Mother Russia. Yeah, this isn't our first call. He wanted to know if I was going to cut my beard for health reasons mm -hmm. for coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Shorter or even to skin. <laughs> um, Vladimir, to answer your question, how is the AR better than the AK? It's not. <laughs> it's just not. But there's a reason why America is so obsessed. He wants to know why America is so obsessed with it, doesn't like the AK as much. And you know what I think it is? It's an American-made firearm. It's That's it. That's it. Because it's not a dirty communist gun, mm -hmm. you know? It's for the same reason that 
coffee is more popular than tea in the United States. Right. It's our thing. Yeah. And in fact, we're not going to use your thing just because it's yours and we don't like you. Right. And we're going to do our own thing and we're going to be free. And if people don't know that that is why coffee, that is a factor of why coffee became so popular in the United States. Because if you remember, we had this little thing in Boston mm-hmm. in the harbor. You mm-hmm. remember that? Yeah. What was it? It was a biscuit party, it was like something a like that. Thing. Surf, yeah, they were surfing waves, Ooh. chewing biscuits. Yeah. I'm talking about the Boston <laughs> Tea Party. Oh, that party. <laughs> yeah. The Boston Tea Party. Uh, so, what it was was um, the colonists had an unfair situation where they're being taxed on all of the tea yeah. that they were being that they were importing and of course being part of England they were only allowed to get tea from England and then they were being charged a major tax on it so Americans early Americans in that spirit of independence said screw you We'll find something else to yeah, drink. Yeah, we're done with your tea. We're going to start with beans. Hot bean water. Hot beans. We're going to drink hot, bitter, dirty bean water. And then we're going to express our freedom with the choice of parts for our gun, the AR-15. Right. And uh, there's other reasons. I think the user-friendly nature of building, because that's another American tradition. Mm-hmm. You can go out and buy a car. But how many guys go out and buy pieces of cars and make a hot rod or something for themselves? I actually know one person that does, but I know more than one person, so it's not a lot of people. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, I mean, that's a common thing. Yeah. And it has been, you know, in modern history, Mm -hmm. and it's become the same thing with ARs. People go out and build their own AR, and even, in some cases, spend more money to have to do it themselves because it's cool to know how to do it. And right. it's a good skill mm-hmm. to have, and you can build it however you want. So the meat and potatoes of an AR-15 is... The heart. The, the heart of the AR-15. Is the lower receiver. So here's an example of a Spikes Tactical. I'm holding it up. Um, this is a forged aluminum receiver. Um, this is the serialized part. So, whoa. Whoa. That's the gun. This is the gun, according to the ATF. So this uh, is machined. First it's forged, and then it's machined out to all the specs that you would need to have interchangeability with uh, components to go inside of here. And then the manufacturer registers the serial number as per government uh, requirements. To say, we've made this many guns, here's the range of serial numbers, this is the model. And because you can build ARs in so many different configurations and calibers, it's required that you put the caliber on the gun. But when we don't know, it can be listed as multi. So that's why it says multi-caliber. But you can buy an AR lower for under $100. I mean, there there are ones that are more, depending on what you get. Mm -hmm. But it's commonplace to buy them for under $100. And then everything else is not a firearm. So you can buy those and have them shipped to you. You can borrow ones. You can make ones if you have those kinds of capabilities. And you can put it all together and have an AR exactly of your own design, whether you go elaborate where you just take common components and put it together. So I think the ability to change them, to modify them, to improve them, to have your own take on them is what attracts people to them. And little improvements are noticeable. One thing that happened out of the range is the safety on your Q firearms Mm -hmm was just a little bit different. So the selector switch on a military issue M16 or M4 or uh, most ARs, when you go to flip that lever, a full auto one, a military one, or a transferable machine gun, like what we have from Midwest Tactical, you would have options. Safe, 
semi-auto and fire, or in some cases, three-round burst and full auto. But you have to lever your thumb a pretty good distance, and then you have a 90-degree change in the lever. So um, when you lever that up, the indicator switch goes straight up. But what was the difference with the Q uh, safety switch? So on the Q safety, it's um, instead of being a 90 degree where the lever is straight up, it's a 45 degree. So you just flip it 45 degrees and it's ready to fire. So it's um, a much less requirement of fine motor skills, just really easy to do. And so that's an improvement Q made. And while it's minor, you want to know what's the difference between a standard or cheap or however you want to refer to it, AR and that, that was a thing that I thought was interesting because when Trevor initially went to put it on fire and fired it, he kind of glanced down like, did I get the safety moved over right? Because it's made a little bit different. Yeah, I honestly, I thought there was something wrong with it. thought your $1,499 <laughs> gun was broken, Logan. You broke it. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't. It's designed to be that way. And, right. of course, if you train with it, you're going to get used to that. Right. But, I mean, I, I don't really see how it's, I mean, an improvement. Like, it takes less strength to push it over? Or what? I, what? how would you define that as an improvement? So, uh, especially when you go from fire to safe and you have to put your thumb in front of the lever and move back. Oh, so, yeah, it's at a little different angle. Yeah, I get you. And, and on a normal day on the range... That's not an issue. Yeah. Could, but if you've ever fired a gun in a fight or flight syndrome response, mm-hmm. meaning your life is threatened, or, uh, you know, one of the examples of training I had, they made us box a three minute round. And so you could get a taste of that fight or flight scenario because you're going to have the potential of getting beat up mm-hmm. and then pick up a firearm and fire at a target. And the difficulty level of hitting a target, even at, you know, a reasonable distance, was much more because your fine motor skills are diminished. One of the things that happens when you hit fight or flight syndrome is your body prioritizes what it's going to do. And it thinks, you got to think primal, like I'm running away from a Mm saber-toothed tiger. I need my main muscle groups. I need to punch. I need to bite. I need to scrap we're not so set up to do very fine skills. So if we can minimize the amount of precision that we have to do with our phalanges, the better off we are. Right. And so I think the idea, just a minor thing, but a notable thing is that's less to have to worry about and less to have to actuate on the firearm. All right, let's roll to the next one, guys. Hey there. Is this that there gun shop show thingy? I got a question for y'all. Me and Bubba, we went thinking about them murder wasps. You know the ones what's in, invading America? Oh, uh, I forgot. My name's Cummins. Cummins D. Cell. Y'all need my name? I, I guess I ain't afraid for you to know who I is. Anyway, I got questions about them murder wasps. I figure they ain't quite as big as a duck. Them suckers is probably fast, you know, like, boom, you know? Like so I got out a few of my toys, and me and Bubba, we've been doing experiments. We started out with Bubba throwing crap to take a shot at and see what I could hit with them. Well, after Bubba throwed the dog chew toy about six times, he was all played out, and the dog, he don't like chasing it no more, seeing as <laughs> I may have bounced a few buckshot off of him. And it turned out Bubba don't throw very fast anyhow, so I got Charlene out here to throw stuff. But she kept hitting me with what she was throwing. Finally, we got the old push mower out and we cranked her up. She don't have no wheel on the left front. You can dig her right down (laughs) to the ground. She throws crap like crazy. So we was throwing the dog chew toy with the mower. And I could hit it pretty regular. But we got to talking about a question we should ask the fellers there at this gun shop show. So here she is. What gauge and what kind of shot should we be stocking up on for them murder wasps? Well, I reckon I'll listen to my answer on the radio. Cummins Diesel, signing Cummins off. Diesel. How'd I do, Bubba? <laughs> I, 
I need to know if Charlene is the mower. I couldn't determine whether or not Charlene was a person or a mower. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> also, I got questions for Cummins Diesel. I could not quite follow what exactly, I, if the dog was involved or just the dog toy. They were using the dog toy to uh, take out the murder wasps, and the dog kept chasing the toy. Well, I think they were practicing for the murder wasps. I think oh. they were shooting at the dog toy. Oh, okay. I see. I, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. It's possible both things happened. Who knows? It was a lot of information. Yeah. So I have been saying since the very first, you'll remember the first time that we decided that we would have a voice mailbox mm-hmm. and we would let people call. I said, get your gun question or anything goes. <laughs> Maybe I messed up when I said that. Yeah. Cummins yeah. Diesel. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't get Denzel Washington out of my mind I don't right know. <laughs> I don't know. But thankfully, your friends in the gun business have you hooked up. There's an expert on taking out flying insects on, uh, with shot shells. Hmm. That's 22 Plankster who I hope will soon become a guest on the Gun Shop Show. Be our friends. Yeah. Please. So I got two things, two pieces of homework. Go to YouTube, type in when the show is over. Make a note right now. Pick up a pen. Sketch this down. Yeah, Logan's got a pen. He'll show you how to do it. Show him. Yeah, show him that click. It's like this. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then right here. Click it out and write down what I'm about to tell you. Yep. It's ready to go. Because this this is homework for the Gun Shop Show loyal fans. This is going to resonate with our people in the Gun Shop Show group. Go to YouTube. Look up 22 Plinkster. This is the guy that his whole channel and his whole bit, his whole thing he does is shoot 22 long rifles at stuff. And he's the guy that can shoot uh, and split a playing card in half um he even taped a playing card to a bicycle wheel and spun it and as it comes around the wheel he could split the card in half i've seen him take a peppermint like a little red and white peppermints flip it out in the air with his thumb and shoot it with a 22 long rifle but i've also seen him shooting wood bees <laughs> with a 22 uh shot shell so you can get a regular 22 long rifle cartridge, but with a little plastic housing with mm-hmm. little bits of shotgun shell in it. And he's blowing up those carpenter bees, which can be a nuisance. Yeah. My last house had a big deck on it, and it was a little bit older, and it was just constant barrage of... I think I remember those. Yeah, like, where they're buzzing they around. They were huge. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it's funny is uh, I grew up everyone telling me that wood bees can't sting you. And they're called carpenter bees, but I grew up calling them wood bees. Mm-hmm. But I, as an adult, I realized um, it turns out that a lot of stuff that happened when I was a kid was just not quite accurate or safe or correct. <laughs> so I looked up, can a wood bee, can a carpenter bee sting you? And... One of the things I thought was interesting is it said it depends on if it's male or female. Mm-hmm. And this is because they're buzzing around me and my kids, and I want to know if we're going to get stung. Right. It says you have to check if they're male or female. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. you pull up a leg or something? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, and so then I'm like, how to tell a male f- and f- versus female carpenter bee. And there's like a little white speck on the middle of their body. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, if I can see this tiny white speck on the bee and they can sting me, <laughs> it's too late. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably already in the danger zone. Plus, those little looters were tearing up my property. So um, Stealing all your wood? Yeah. Yeah. And they don't make honey. So they're worthless bees. Oh, man. Yeah, it sounds... I mean, but they... I don't know. I guess if they're not making honey, they're probably not hanging out with the plants. But this brings a question to mind. Yeah. Something that's been been bugging me since you first mentioned the words would be. And that is, how much wood would a would be be if a would be could, could be, be wood? wood? It's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
You know, it you know, was not that, easy to formulate that in my mind while we were talking. You know, yeah, <laughs> well, that would be a good question You're right. to ask. <laughs> it's pun time. Yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> we are winding down the show. Yeah, we're all getting ready for nap time. Oh. I'm starting to get fussy. So um, this has been the live stream portion of the Gun Shop Show. We have lots more that we can and should talk about on the topic of AR-15s. We've covered why they're popular how they're different than a Mini-14, uh, why does America love them uh, more so than other countries? Well, they were an American military weapon, um, and they were popularized that way. Um, oh, thank you. Trevor's signaling me, and he just reminded me that we have a contribution on the topic of AR-15s that came from our Facebook group. And that's the wrong name. That's what threw me off. <laughs> oh, I thought you said that was his name. It's close. It's close. <laughs> um, so one of our uh, Gun Shop Show listeners and member of the Gun Shop Show group, Cliff. Cliff. <laughs> so close. <laughs> he's, holding up a, he's holding up a dry <laughs> erase board that says Clint. <laughs> and I'm close. like, <laughs> sorry, Cliff. So I appreciate the, uh, the reminder. Although I'm like, who's Clint? What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, so Cliff from the Gun Shop Show group posted something. And again, you're welcome to post in that group. If it's related to the show, great. If it's just uh, something in terms of sporting firearms, the supporting of the Second Amendment, um, it could be anything. I mean, you can let us know what you're doing on a Saturday afternoon because it is a cool group of like-minded people. But he posted something that I have never held in person, yeah. never held in my hands. And I said, that would be great to have on the show to talk about the extreme variety of options that you have right. in um, AR-15s. And this was, did you guys see it yet? Do you know what it is, Logan? I haven't seen it. So it's a, well, let's just let it roll. In the roll? Yeah, let it roll. Right, here we go. Hello, it's everyone. Uh, my name is Cliff. I was asked to speak briefly on this Gilboa snake that I bought. It's brand new. Um, these were developed over in Israel. It's a double barrel. Um, manufactured AR. here in the U.S. This one is here, but what? the original guy that developed and figured double out how to do, do the double barrel AR was out of Israel. No. Uh, essentially, what he did is he figured out how to put two ARs together. You got a left and a right AR. Uh, they both have independent shooting chambers. Um, as you can see there, there's two 30-round uh, magazines that both clip in there. Um, I decided with mine to set mine up for close quarters combat. So I went with the Trijicon red dot scope to attach on the side. Um, there is two. I don't know if you can see very well. There's two triggers in here. You can pull them both at the same time or individually. Yeah. Um, is in regards to setting up um, the shot, you've got two options here. I'll try and flip over the best I can. I went with a foregrip on mine because, as you probably aware, it's the weight of two ARs, so it's a little heavier. But as you can see, those right there, and then those there on that side, basically it comes with a little uh, like Allen wrench. And each barrel you can adjust, like the left one. You can adjust up and down and the right one uh, horizontally. So one vertically, one horizontally. And that way you can either have both barrels hitting the same target or you can have both barrels hitting side by side on the target. Give you a little bit of leeway to miss with whatever you're shooting at. But all in all, it, it was a, a little heavier than I expected. Um, great, fun gun to shoot. I wouldn't recommend if you get one to set it up from what I've seen for long distance, any time to long distance, I would keep it close quarters. Um, my ideal dream would be to go with the shorter barrels, um, but I don't want to go through the paperwork with that, so I'm going to probably keep it as is. But anyway, that's a quick rundown of what I got in regards to the Gilboa Snake. Got any questions, let me know. All right, so his name's Cliff, and he, if you scroll down in the Gun Shop Show page, you can see his post, and I'm sure that he would welcome any questions. I'm watching Logan hadn't seen this yet. <laughs> no, I hadn't. He's over there, like, reacting. <laughs> Quite a unique thing, huh? It is. Incredible. I, I would say so. I have 
several questions. Okay. Well, I'm no expert on this because I'm also okay. just learning I'll about answer. It. I'll take these <laughs> questions, Bear with Eli. me. Bear with me. <laughs> okay. First off, is it considered ambidextrous? Yes. It would have to be, right? Right. Because so, it's, it's a mirror. So, I mean, I couldn't tell. Was it one trigger or two? It's two. And he mentioned that. He did? Um, he, he did? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's two triggers. You can fire them at the same time or you can fire them separately. That is insane. And also, um, I think his is configured to be the same caliber. Mm -hmm. But, and this goes back to the modularity of mm -hmm. an AR, and I'm going to grab one of these, because behind me we have um, Core 15s, which is an affordable um, AR platform. We've got some uh, ATIs in 9mm. And um, let's see, what else do I have up here? Um uh, that's the ATI. It's so weird having it behind you and then you flip around and it's backwards. But <laughs> anyway, um, you can change these components. This is where you guys talk. So I was thinking that uh, this yes, is a ridiculous yes. scenario, but when he said it was essentially two ARs stuck together, in my mind I was thinking bread ties. Yeah. Just sandwich <laughs> them together. Right I know bread. that's ridiculous, but that's my job here, folks. <laughs> the... Uh, the, this is just a, an example of an ATI 9mm. Um, a lot of the things on this 9mm AR are the same as any 5.56 AR. So you've got the same basic idea in the lower receiver. Um, you've got the same handguard. The barrel looks the same until you see the diameter of the uh, end of the barrel or, mm -hmm. or where the projectile would come out. Um, but in the case of that Gilboa, it's going to use the same kind of barrel nut, which is all, you know, one reason I think the AR is more popular than the AK is it bolts together with tools that every red-blooded American might have for the most part. There's a handful of specialty tools. You're like, talking about a butter knife? Just kidding. I grew up <laughs> poor. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> That's all they have to do. Yeah, every time we're working on something in the shop, I'm like looking for the right kind of screws and the right kind of bits, and Trevor's like, what if we, took, we chewed up some bubble gum <laughs> <laughs> and we smirch it on I'm there? The MacGyver of tools. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> Like, he doesn't even want to go to tools. He's like, what can I do with office supplies and determination? Right. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, uh, paper clips are amazing. So when I said tools that red-blooded Americans would have, I meant more like Allen wrenches, not <laughs> butter knives. So um, you can take, for example, this handguard would come off with Allen wrenches, and then you could change the barrel. So with that Gilboa, which I'm going to be honest like, if you're talking pure practical application, mm -hmm. I don't know. But as a unique piece of worksmanship and the shock factor, which we used to see people buy guns mm -hmm. based off the way people are going to react when they pull them out at the range or a day when they're getting together with their buddies. There's no doubt about that. Like the the high point yeet cannon, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> buying it merely for the, uh, so, the hysterical factor. Uh, high point is a famously cheap brand of firearms, and they have become the butt of jokes within the firearm community. Mm -hmm. And the way I understand it, although I wasn't there for this, but high point came out, and they were going to have a new gun that they were going to release, and they decided. Because this is a popular thing in um, in the era of um, what am I thinking of Kickstarter? Uh, yeah. What do they call that? Yeah. Crowdfunding, right? Is, is to let your supporters be involved in the development of the thing or the product. Right. So they went out and said, "We're going to have a vote off nominations, <laughs> and then a vote off for the name of the new gun." 
which they must have underestimated the power of the internet. They hadn't heard of Bodie McBoatface, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> was that, uh, this is like a similar thing, right? Yeah, it was yeah. the, uh, I, want, I can't remember. I want to say some company in English or something. I don't remember. Look this up on your own. But yeah, they, uh, they crowdsourced the name of some boat. And the one that won was Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> and there's other ones like that too. I think the same thing was with the Yeet Cannon. They oh, yeah. crowdsourced the name. Yeah. And you should expect that people are going to be ridiculous. But on top of that, like you're just going to make people more devoted to oh, yeah. whatever it is if you allow them to be right. themselves. So these these people, someone nominated Yeet Cannon. <laughs> and then it, that's what won the votes. And then High Point was forced to put Yeet Cannon on the side of one of their guns. Oh, they didn't want Yeet Cannon. Oh, they, yeah, at first they were pissed, and then people... They were like, we'll call it, like, the YC-1 or something like that, and yeah, not actually call it the Yeet Cannon. And people, there was a backlash. People were like, we won't buy it. Yeah, they were like, you asked what we want. <laughs> this was your deal. This <laughs> was your deal. <laughs> we voted, and we said Yeet Cannon. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many guys, but it has been a multitude of gun owners and these are serial gun owners like this isn't mm-hmm. their first gun they own what they consider more respectable more practical nicer firearms than high points and yet they went back and bought a yeet cannon for the fact that one guy bought it bought it for its friend to insult them <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wouldn't be too insulted but like oh sweet you bought me something i can go trade off for something yeah, else that he bought it just to see his buddy's reaction <laughs> when he got a yeet cannon now correct me if i'm wrong eli but the yeet cannon is not any different than the other one it was modeled after they just put the word yeet cannon on it or uh, something the, my understanding is they were legitimately going to make a new model of gun and they mm-hmm. wanted to get a name for it and then the Yeet Cannon result happened on the vote. Uh-huh. And I think where they landed was they just, they still made the new gun something else, oh. but they but they put Yeet Cannon on something, and then people bought it. But it was funny Shameful. because they, they got exactly what they asked for, and they weren't right. happy. And then it made people mad. Like, why, yeah. why, uh, why ask us to do it and then reject our answer? Yeah. Well, I think in some of the other instances that I uh, talked about, they wavered as well on that name, uh, but ended up coming back to it. And uh, I mean, it was like the Jones boat subtitle, Bodie McBoatface, (laughs) something like that. That's awesome. They made a compromise. I learned all that on Reddit. (laughs) I don't Reddit anymore. All right. (sighs) This has been fun. Yeah. That was a lot of voicemail, man. Yeah, it was was a lot of voicemail. It should be an empty box by now, don't you think? I hope we answered your questions um, to the best of our ability. We are going to have more on the topic of ARs because if if the topic of ARs was Lake Michigan, we just gave you like a water bottle's worth just a scotch just a scotch this much also the other day remington said skosh ooh is that that seems like a very um skosh like well, fancy pronunciation of the French. word skosh i mean i think skosh. it's skosh is probably the best cuz it's it ends in s c h but it but probably here in southwest missouri it's just skosh it's skosh all right, it's scotch. Get over yeah. to scotch. Scotch. Okay, so uh, we like to educate Skosh. ourselves. Uh, spelled S K O S H, actually. A small amount, a bit smidgen. So is it normally spelled that way? Because I've been spelling scotch, C H for a while. Um, Yikes. Yeah, it, that's Missouri. Yeah. <laughs> Wordsmith.org has it spelled S C H, but you know, I mean, as long as you're whoever you're talking to understands what you're saying, who cares? Yeah. Say what you want. Yeah. yeah. Unless it's the yeah. wrong thing. And don't right. say it. It's the thing get, that offends me. Right. Don't say it. Don't say the Whoa. things that offend him. <laughs> Guys, I can't tell you how much fun it is to be able to talk to you every week here on the Gun Shop Show. We 
are going to have two hours on the radio, which will really be nothing different for you. If you're here on the live stream, you're still going to get the live stream. It's all going to be the same, but it mm -hmm. helps us grow the show. And growing the show is important because this, I know it just seems like shenanigans and it is a lot of shenanigans, but it is, um, it takes some work and some money to put this on and cost money to keep it on all the outlets. We want to keep doing it. We want your feedback. We want it to be how you want it to be. So if you are the listener, you are the uh, viewer and you want to see something a little bit different, in terms of what we're covering, you want more of something, less of something. If you love it, we love to hear when you love it, <laughs> you know, but we also want to know what you want to see different. And if you have a contribution, please jump in the group. If you want a little bit of feedback about how to do it, if you do, if you have something cool like Cliff's double barrel gun, or it doesn't have to be something especially unique, but you go out to the range and you got a trick or a tip or, uh, you know, a review and you want to participate and be part of the show. Go to the Gun Shop Show Facebook group. Chime in. We're pretty responsive. We're going in there answering comments, um, interacting the best that we can. So please do that. Please share the feeds um, both while we're live, after the fact. Um, and then keep in mind that we are still in the phase of bringing on sponsors. Although we've had a lot more interest in the last few weeks and we only have a limited number of sponsors. Uh, that we can support on the show. I want to say thank you to the ones that we do have, which includes the Woodshed on the Square. It includes Mid-America RV, um, About Anywhere Porta Potties, Net Fishes, Cave Gang Pizza and Pub. Thank you to those. If you would like us to promote your business, which we can do by creating your own unique ad, which we can play here in the show, uh, please let us know. And um, go ahead and... Uh, Join the Facebook group, GoToLibertyTreeGuns.com. Click the merch section. Get your free decal. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for learning all about ARs with your friends in the gun business and listening to The Gun Shop. Oh.